everybody. I think uh, we can go on the bus now. Would you mind going on the bus? Yeah, we've got a fairly tight schedule this morning, so the sooner we get down to the better. If you just From the leafy affluence of West End Glasgow, the university's social work students are setting off on an expedition. They're going to explore the habitat of their future clients, the undergrowth of another world just across the high street. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andy Gibb, and I lecture in the Department of Geography in this university. We've been doing this trip for a series of years, uh, for about five years now in total, because your tutors in the Diploma and Social Work course felt that since most of your casework and your client work would take place in Glasgow, it would be a good idea to uh, go out and have a look at the environments in which your clients live. Now, I assume that you're all socially aware and that you've read about social polarisation and the splitting, uh, the spatial disaggregation of the middle classes from the working classes in most uh, British cities, in just every British city. And Glasgow is, is no exception. In fact, Glasgow is an extreme case of that spatial disaggregation. If we just pause for a second, Jim, till I say something about comprehensive redevelopment, uh, and then they'll understand what we're seeing as we go along. Now, 29 comprehensive development areas were scheduled for the city of Glasgow, involving the demolition of the greater part of its tenement property. Now, you're looking at the northern part of one of these comprehensive development areas. Uh, they've drawn a line around this area, and they've taken out everything that was in here. And it wasn't just demolition, because in order to demolish the houses, you've got to get the people out first. It was social disruption, population displacement on a huge and brutal scale. And the people had to go somewhere. Uh, they were put out to the peripheral housing schemes, or they were stacked up in the multi-storey flats. This was the second city of the empire, and many of the schemes that you see owe much more to the perception of Glasgow as it used to be by the local authority in particular, the councillors I'm talking about, than to Glasgow as it really was at the time when they made their decisions. It must have the biggest and most grandiose scheme of any city in the United Kingdom. All right, if you could just make your way down to that patch of hard ground down there, just follow Stuart and uh, we'll have a look at the top of the city here. Okay. If you look down to the south, you can see the main axis of High Street. So that's the real social divide in the city with the working classes to the east and the middle classes to the west. And therefore, many of the social aspects in which you are particularly interested are manifested most strongly in that eastern part of the city. So this kind of class division, which began so very long ago, uh, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, still continues uh, to a very great extent today. All this was a slum clearance site a century ago, quickly rebuilt in a spirit of Victorian philanthropy as a model town. So they all grew old at once, these tens of thousands of tenement dwellings. A second slum generation in need of firm and forceful planning. In the 1960s, as in the 1870s, the plans were imposed in the people's interest. And the people of Glasgow watched while their home was flattened as a test bed for rash and fashionable urban policies. Their city had caught the blight. Twenty years later, they're still trying to find a cure. Professor David Donison rides the urban renewal trail checking on the effects of the 200 million pounds they've spent in the last five years renovating the East End. In the best Glasgow tradition, it's the biggest, most comprehensive project of its kind in Britain. But at last, it's fashionable to show interest in what the people of the city think. What's been happening around here? Do you live 
Do you live here? I live too far away. Do you see a lot of changes? Oh, big changes, but I mean, I do know this, spend a lot of cash. What are, what are the main things that we need in? Oh, more work, right. Yeah. There's not very much work, that's for sure. Do you have work but yourself? I, no, I've been able to live six years. Six years? Yeah. What kind of work would you be looking for? I'm a tour and ferry trade. Mm -hmm. I prefer maintenance engineering. Yeah. Well, the uh, living accommodation is getting a lot better, you know? Uh-huh. But, but the unemployment's a, a, a problem at the right. moment. Because my age has beat me. He's 62 right. years of age. Ah, it's, it's the same in general all over, I would think so. I mean, it's all over Britain. They're just, that's one of these, like, the 1920s. Yeah. I was only a boy then, of course, but I can remember going to soup kitchens and that as a boy. There are big changes here. I know the people were coming back from the grave, my mother and the mother, they wouldn't know the place. Mm -hmm. That changed, you know. Well, while you can understand that the old Glasgow had terrible problems to overcome, why was the remedy they chose so brutal? Why were the people uprooted? I think the massive problems that had to be tackled in neighbourhoods like this led to the creation of a pretty Stalinist bunch of bureaucracies centralized, authoritarian. It was the only way of cutting through all the... You know, there might be a hundred people who owned property in a street like this. Owners, tenants, subtenants. To clear all that and acquire it and redevelop, you had to create these, these powerful bureaucracies. And Scotland is accustomed to, to authority, to power. You see how teachers deal with kids in the schools, uh, how, how doctors talk to patients, uh, how the, the traffic is managed by the, the road builders and the people who design the, the traffic lights here. They're accustomed to telling people what to do. Many EastEnders were simply told to leave the square mile of the city where their families had lived for two, three, four generations. The motorway was coming through. As the planners used to say, if you want to drain the swamp, you don't consult the frogs. Once, Glasgow was to have had twice as much urban motorway as London. There are scraps of the great plan still to be seen. Roads to nowhere, going nowhere, from nowhere. Most of them will never be completed. But where they were drawn on the map, Whole communities withered in their path, blighted for a quarter of a century. And where did the people go? Of course, to the biggest housing schemes, the tallest tower blocks in Europe. Or they went to Hutch E, the pet name for the 750 flats of the Hutchison Town Estate in the rebuilt Gorbals. Twelve years ago, this was a revolutionary new approach to house building, tested in Algeria but not, unfortunately, in the west of Scotland. A decade of damp and decay has driven out most of the tenants. Only a handful, like Bill Sharkey and Willie McLean, still live here. So when were these opened? Please, fast. 1972. 1972, Willie. With the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, so big the Queen and the Duke? Yes, yes, the Queen and the Duke. Big showpiece. Everybody here, big this crowds. One? This one? That's yeah, the one yes. there. That's the one the Queen opened. Royalty came here and opened them. All the, all the pomp and ceremony, big crowds, and here we are. <laughs> we got a letter saying that the Queen remembers very well the day she came and it opened Hutch E, and she felt very disturbed and distressed. The conditions of people were, working, were living under. We got a better letter and more understanding from the Queen than what we did from the District Council. Is it still possible to go inside? Certainly, I caught us to open. Most of them are blocked off, but this one's opened. Mr. McNulty still they, stays here, of course. That's why it's open. They, they seem to put um, doors across the ends Aye, of some of them. Keep the, the vandals out. Yeah. Waste of time. Complete waste of time. So when did you first notice that there were damp problems in these buildings? They were from the start. By the first year, you know. But they, they came in and told us that, don't worry about it, it's just a new building, take time to settle in and dry out, you know, and it'll, it'll soon write itself. He says one of the under secretaries to Mr. Brown says one of the major factors of the dampness was 
The old people having so many hot baths. I, that must have gone down really well. Oh, I, it, certainly it, did. it wasn't your fault, it was our fault. Breathed too much. That's a fact now you, that you give off a uh, condensation when you breathe. So after these first couple of years were over, and the dampness still hadn't gone away, did you start to spot other things going wrong with the uh, with the buildings? I mean, did people sign, see the signs of the dampness? Oh, I would spread, it starts to spread right through wallpaper, comes right through wallpaper, spreads further and further into the room. Carpets, dampness, beasties, your clothing is that's a, a, damp That's smell. those little white maggots. Ah, yeah, it's something like, things like that. So people were having to throw the furniture out Dark blue suits, dark blue suits and like that. It was on a whitish way, you know, in the wardrobes. White Move, fungus. You'd moving all your furniture away from the walls and keeping them in the side, everything stacked over them, that's good. But it, it took them years off. It's condensation or sort of Leave your windows open. Keep your heaters on and put your windows open. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the sort of stuff that were... Oh, that's, that's reasonably mild, you know, but that's the way it goes. And after a nice warm summer like this, just a vanity goes away, you know, the paper stays loose, you know. Just trying to have a peel See the paper below that? That's two coats of paper. That's the original paper. That's how it goes, it just falls down, peels off. But with this much dampness, the smell must have been terrible. Oh, what power Why? If you, if you went out yourself, if you, take, you come out of one of these houses and went into any company or anything like that, you would smell your own clothes. You would know it was you, because it's unmistakable. Or if you went for a holiday and come back to your own house, you'd take a laugh. The strange thing wrong. was, when they always sent officials from the housing department, they always had a cold in their nose and couldn't smell. Oh, they couldn't smell anything, right? Not too bad. Heavy cold, no smell in their nose. When we moved here, and we thought really, when they built these houses, this was going to be the new gardens, away from the old tenements. Architects, I don't understand at all how, they, how people could sit and get paid all that money to design things like that. And only a matter of 10 years later, everybody agrees that it's all wrong. I hope this is pulled down in, in decent houses. Just go back to decent houses. Maybe you find it kind of do like the building the airplane or something like that. Build one and see if it works. Not just get the lot and say, right, why don't you build 12 blocks and that's it, and 10 years later, here we are. I mean, we should know how to build a house by this time. And most people wouldn't move into a house, I think that's same. Um, that's it, you know? No more flittings and removals and upsets. There's ten wasted years just waiting to move again. Knowing that you'd have to move, but you never knew when. Next month, maybe next year. <coughs> you feel you'd be sort of sad leaving the place, too, you know? Be here for a while. It was quite, it was quite nice at first, you know? The people that make the thing, you know? The buildings are bad, the people are great. After 10 years of campaigning against the council, Bill Sharkey too is moving out to a house where he can take hot baths and breathe in cold weather without making the building rot. Not everyone is so lucky. There are no plans to move the 400 families that still live in the grey and miserable development next door, the towers of Queen Elizabeth Square. They were designed by Sir Basil Spence, a concrete superlative, the showpiece of Glasgow's comprehensive redevelopment. They're so well designed, so well appointed, they even have their own ground floor wind tunnel. Perhaps that's why Queen Elizabeth Square won an architectural award. More likely, as the head of Glasgow's housing department says, it merely shows the divide that's widened between architects, planners and the people. David Donison believes it's a symptom of a wider gap. In these old industrial cities, 
struck by depression. And the difference in living standards, the difference in opportunities between rich and poor is greater than in the more prosperous cities of the South. And then they have been more sharply divided between East End and West End, between the city and the suburbs. The people who administer this city, the people who run this city, few of them come to the East End ever. Many of them don't live in the city at all. They live out in the suburbs a long way away. It's not surprising if uh, we have had some pretty inept policies that have paid scant attention to the, the needs and the feelings of the folk who live here. There are only one third of the people here that there were here 25 years ago. It's like, it's like the Blitz. I mean, you've, you've moved out two thirds of the people. And the people who've moved out are, are the families. It's the, it's the parents, it's the working age groups. These are the people we've lost. We've got masses of youngsters between 15 and 20. We've got masses of old people. And, and if, you, if you focus all that in, in, in one neighborhood, in a few streets, you're asking for trouble. You've created a kind of Siberia. I never thought this would come. Everything's all changed. They took away all the slums. Now it's nicer, you know, but lonelier. In a strange neighborhood, you know, they're all strange. Don't know my friends here at all. A rainy day, I'm, or a windy day, I'm a prisoner. How far away have you ever, have you travelled from Bridgeton? Just to Dunoon, in the convent in Lanark. When I quit the hospital, sent me to the convent in Lanark. That was to convalesce, was build it? Me, build yeah. me up. That's the furthest away you've ever been? Furthest away. Never travelled. I was at Dunoon one day and I was young. I mean, I my mother. That was a while ago. Never travelled. So you've never been to England? Oh, never been as far as that. What's it like, this area now, compared to the way it used to be? It used to be a cheery. Very, very cheery. Where the work was working, you know, and where buildings are, different kind of people, they're all away. They're dead and some are away. But no money visitors. I see people going up to visit, you know, but I'm always myself here. Nobody really comes at night. Just, I'm just left sitting. I go on a wee walk. I read a book. I watch if a good program. I go to my bed. That's my life here, because I've nothing to look at. Therefore, I look at all night. Nothing to look at. The loneliness. Loneliness is a wee trouble no, nobody sees. You don't realise what loneliness is. But the hand is like me too. Lonely. Who would like a tin of granny soup? Honey Cullen is an ingredient in that other granny soup that's been created at the New East End. She's argued with the council. They say they've done what they can. She's begged to be moved back to friends and community. Someone else says they know best. You start these now. <laughs> Who would like a nice skirt? I always model them. No, no. I've been worn. Do you know what's up with you? You're off here at the woman next to you knows you've bought second hand clothes. <laughs> but when old people get together, the teacup conversation invariably turns to the real fear of the inner city. Young and old stranded together, unthinking, uneasy neighbours. There are too many old people in Bridgeton. Uh -huh. Lee 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 short. Lee 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 short. Lee 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 L
at 20 past nine in the morning, at I came out the post office, I went into Cochran's, I got two pound nine pence of messages. I stooped down to put my purse in my bag, and they flung, the one at my back flung me in my face. The purse flew out my hand, and the one with the front, and the front to me ran away, with the, looked at the purse, the two of them ran away, I ran after them, couldn't catch it, my face was all blood. And then we got, I phoned the police and I got up the stairs. The policeman came, or oh, three or four times on Friday, and he asked me, did I know the men? Well, didn't he know who they were? So I says, no, I didn't know them. He said he was sorry, that's what I could do. Mm -hmm. oh, it's so terrible, you know right enough. That they, somebody came to my door at three o'clock in the morning. And we we get that all the time. Aye, well, that was on a Tuesday. And then on the Friday again, it was a quarter past five in the morning when they shut mm -hmm. the door. Mm -hmm. Well, you're frightened, you can't you open it. it. No, 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 I didn't you open it, no. no. Too frightened, too. We get that up in the flats all the time, the recluse and others. Oh, Because uh, we kind of get peace for them. Give us a shot. 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 It's a lot of people that scared for those snippers because they did that. And they're thinking that they're mere violent. If you're walking the line, it's a lot of rubbish. People sniffing lure are going to jump out and attack you and hit you with no bricks nor that. Any swords, things like that. No, I mean, that's how you get a bad name. That's how you get bad right up in the paper. But you don't really do that. Is this like drinking and all that? No, I mean, but say you go to the pub and you get drunk, people start to want to fight and all that, didn't they? Yeah. Well, if you're sniffing glue and you're listening to music, you need to borrow it. You need to borrow it, you know what I mean? You're just... You're just just... That's the world of your own, know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Give me an example. You can see pink elephants, no, tigers... No, that's a lot of rubbish, by the way. I do see them. No, no that's, that's a lot of You know what it's that, you? It depends what you're looking at and what you're buzzing. Uh, now, what, what, I mean, what you're uh, looking at, it all depends on that. You're sitting and you're it's buzzing at that tree. Really if you're moving, really you'll get up and running. Hey, Paul, what are you doing, son, and beside him? You're hearing yourself now. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, son? Hey, CD. Hey, CD, Paul. Just let yourself relax more and more, and you will see that in a few minutes, as soon as the feeling of deep relaxation starts to get more and more deep, your eyelids will be sticking tighter and tighter, and your right hand will become lighter and lighter, more and more light. It is getting very, very light, just as light as a feather. And with the light feelings growing more and more in your right hand, your eyelids are sticking tighter and tighter and tighter, and your body and mind is floating away into a wonderful, deep, relaxed, comfortable state. And when you feel so wonderfully calm, with full of confidence, you will see that you will have a less and less desire, compulsion to sniff glue. You will want to spend your time in anything, whatever you want to play, whether it is dominoes, skittles, cards, football, and as soon as you divert your attention, feeling wonderfully calm, relaxed, in playing dominoes... The young, remainded in the East End, drift from one dark tunnel to another. Heroin, booze and Evo stick are the great escapes in Glasgow. Dr. Misra tries to provide another in hypnotherapy. The kids play the game because he means well. We are very pleased that you are doing so really well and you are going to do even more and more better. Now I'm going to count from one to six. At the count of six, you will open your eyes and be wide awake again, feeling very refreshed, cheerful, happy, contented, very relaxed mentally and physically, feeling more and more optimistic. 
with a wonderful feeling of calmness, control and confidence. One, two, three, four, five, six. Very good. Open your eyes. Let yourself feel the relaxation. Good. Most wake up to find the same nothing, the same hopelessness there was before. Some do find a place for themselves. Alan and Angela, both unemployed, found an escape in the poetry and films they've made about a wild corner of Glasgow. They take their message across the high street, Glasgow's Great Divide, to a private school in the West End. concrete jungle, in this world of trouble, where we think we're deceived, it's so hard to believe. There is an oasis, a place we all need, a book we could read to learn what's below us, if someone would show us how to preserve what we like, to be taught how to fight for the only land we have, our only green not starved, by our advance in industry, which is leaving nothing left to see, if we all could become a same, a one, and not reject, if we only would protect, and we all could only try, our land would never die. It's in the shadow of the tower blocks where they stay, the bend in the river that Alan and Angela have campaigned to save. A filled-in rubbish dump, run to seed, but the only really remote place in the industrial colony of the East End. They took their homemade propaganda to London, to the Royal Ecological Society, and they found people listened. At home in Glasgow, talk of butterflies and natural places can bring on an acute attack of official deafness. So will something like this tortoiseshell stay here all the year round, or will, will this migrate as well? No, the tortoiseshell butterfly will probably stay here because there's enough of its food plant for it to be here for the whole year. It'll probably be here and then come out again next spring. So it'll overwinter here on the loop? Yeah. This is the giant hogweed. This is supposed to be dangerous, isn't it? The, the sap. Uh-huh. If you get the, the sap on your skin and uh, the sun gets at it, then it, goes, it blisters. And that's how they, they reproduce with these... Like something out there, the triffids. The wind-blown seeds, that's how they reproduce. Lots of young people in this area, believe it or not, I'm sure would be quite willing even to volunteer to help to manage the place. But do you want to conserve it as part of a, a much bigger conservation area here? I mean, I thought that the, uh, the government was supposed to be looking for ideas for job creation, and here's one here. They don't seem to acknowledge the value of the place while it's there. What sort of response have you had from people like uh, councillors and, the, and the, you know, the local authority when you've suggested to them that they should keep this as a green area in the middle of the city? I think they seem to have their own plans. I think they'll go ahead with their own plans, no matter what we see anyway. And what, what will those plans be? What will happen to this place well, if they do go ahead with that plan? A motorway going across here, or an industrial estate. But uh, they seem to have shelved the idea until 1985 or something like that. So they might come back to that idea again. What would you like to happen to this, ideally? The most we could hope for is that it became a nature reserve. That would be really what we'd love. I mean, nature reserve in the middle of Glasgow is something for a start. But if we couldn't get anything like that, what we just keep hoping for just now is that as long as it doesn't get built on,
when you say to somebody, do you think you'd like a motorway flying past your window, they immediately say no, so it must mean that they'd like the place to be the same as it is. The only time they would start complaining is when they seen anything's beginning to get built on this piece of land, and by then it'd be too late. Perhaps it's already too late to save the guts and spirit of the old working Glasgow. Perhaps a shrug and a sense of humour is their best prospect now. Hamburg is off for Nothing for nothing. Down your belly, my boy. Take her to the river. No, no, no way. No way. No I way. Maybe no. Put, on, put on Grimes' pine. Well, every time you leave here, you, you get shipwrecked at Dumbarton. <laughs> three <laughs> times. I've been aground. Three bloody times you took a boat to the river. And three times you get shipwrecked at Dumbarton. I'm actually getting shipwrecked at Dumbarton for good sake. It's always dark. It's only made bowling. <laughs> it's an engine problem. Jimmy Grimes has found one way of winning the battle between us and them. I can't help that. Grimes, the poor pirate, with a decrepit fourth-hand sailing boat. He's turned his back on them, doesn't work, doesn't claim benefit, doesn't appear on any official list. Jimmy Grimes saw his Glasgow going under. He realised that the blight that's wiped out the tenement communities and silted the river is ever so slowly infecting the people of the East End. A people that once had natural resistance. The Clyde's finished now. I mean, when I sailed out the Clyde, um, it was packed with ships. Now, the, first, the place where I first sailed out here is now a car park. They filled it in. Now you see a lot of gloom and depression. There's a lot of... Always the north and the Midlands always gets the worst end of anything that's happened economically. Any chance of a job? If you look along Govan, and you see all these guys who are capable of building ships and capable of doing all sorts of traditional work that they've done in the Clyde. Um, but like I say up here, we suffer. There's too many people unemployed. Now that if you don't have a job, it seems to be a stigma. It doesn't bother me, it never has. Right, I'll see you later on, Jim. See you Cheerio. I've always been a wanderer, and the glass region's a wanderers. We've wandered all over the world and we've settled over all. I wouldn't give one cobblestone of Glasgow for London. I mean, I spent my life in this city. My roots are here. A lake here. Freedom. It's away for everybody. Silence. Well, usually silence. You make your you decide everything yourself. If I want to go back, I go back. If I want to go in there, I go in there. If I want to go over there, I go over there. And I don't have to go back there. I can carry food. I can sleep on it. I spent a lot of time travelling. I was at sea for seven years. I played in a band for seven years. I think it happens in sevens. I don't know. I'm restless. But you see, what you're doing, surely, getting on this boat of yours, calling it Spirit of Freedom disappearing down the Clyde. And that's chicken out, isn't it? It's escaping, of course. Do you blame me? <laughs> no, what do you want me to do? Sit on Glasgow. They've turned into a graveyard. There's nothing. As a matter of fact, 
the slums as it's called, and I don't know, I prefer the slums. At least there was a certain amount of friendship in the place, and there's now absolutely nothing. They build flats, and they're rotten, they're damp, and, and they move people out, but people can only be pushed back so far. At some point, they must react. It's frightening, very, very, very frightening. OK, we're coming to the end of the trip here, and this is a very useful focal point, at the Bridgeton Cross uh, umbrella, this nice Victorian umbrella. Now, what you're particularly interested in as social workers is obviously the people of this area. And in terms of people, you're dealing with a small residue of what the population once was here. And that means that you're looking at a population pyramid which in many ways resembles that of a country which has been through a major war. And indeed, looking at some of the landscape, you could almost believe that too. Britain, it's possible, is moving into a post-industrial society. And in a post-industrial society, you simply can't expect the regeneration of traditional industry, the recreation of new jobs in the traditional manner. We must expect people to do more to help themselves. And the experiments that they've conducted here, I think, have a number of lessons of crucial significance for other British cities. So if we bear that in mind, I think it's probably time to go back on the bus. You can mull that over as we head back to the university. I don't know. The sea doesn't frighten me. People will frighten me. Every second person I meet is a social worker. Anybody in this country can come into this city, 150, 200 quid a week, go up there, there's a car, go up there and talk to them people, try and calm them down. Glasgow's always suffered. They're the under, always been the underdogs. Maybe if they're a wee bit harder, a wee bit more arrogant, they would have got further. Once I lived the life of a millionaire Spend all my money and I just didn't care Count all my friends out for a mighty good time Bought them all high-priced liquor Champagne and wine And I began to fall so low Ain't got no money and I ain't got no place to go What's the matter? Pump bus. The ghost pump bus. You mean we're sinking? No, exactly. We've got a bucket. <laughs> You're going to see a bucket job in a minute. <laughs> if ever I get my hands on a dollar again, I'm going to hold on to it. It's my only friend. Thank you.